So we've been talking about uh, we've been this series called Divergent. Here's the way I've been picturing this as we've gone along. In our world, in our culture, in any uh, culture, society, part of the world, the, the group that you're part of, there's kind of a current, there's a momentum, there's a direction that the world is going to pull us along in order to live our lives. And as followers of Christ, we are called to choose, to identify and decide where our lives should diverge from that current of the culture around us. And so this morning, we're going to explore what does that look like when we talk about love? What is the current, what is the momentum, what is the understanding of love in our world? And how are we as Christians called to diverge from that um, however, before we talk about love, we're going to talk first about quitting, obviously. Um, grab your program on the back, I, I put some filled with white stuff, if you like that sort of thing. Um, and I've got an opening question. When is a time that you have quit? When was the time you said, I'm done, I'm going to throw in the towel, this is over, I'm just going to quit? What time have you done? What's the time you've done it? A number of times came to my mind in my life. Um, and quitting can happen kind of on a skate, right? So over here in fifth grade, I was in Taekwondo. And I decided I didn't like Taekwondo. It's all right. right? Not that big of a deal. Um, in sixth grade, I played hockey, which in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, is a big deal, right? You are never more than one mile from a hockey rink in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Never. with you hold but in sixth grade, I decided, no, no, I'm not going to hockey. I'm going to be a dentist here. That was a, little, that was a little bigger of a deal, right? Um, quitting can sometimes be small. It can sometimes be, you know, I'm going to quit one thing, but it's to do something else. Then there are other times where quitting is actually unimaginably large, where we give up on something that we should have fallen through with, where we throw away something that we should have close and cherish. In your lives, this morning, I want to start by asking us, when is a time that you quit? I want us to get into the experience, that sort of emotional, mental state. I want us to remember, what's that like when we say, you know what? I'm done. Um, this can happen for a lot of reasons. There can be a lot of emotions, there can be a lot of experiences that lead up to that moment. Um, it can happen because of frustration or anger. We just kind of lose it and we lose control and we say, I'm done with it. It can happen because of a sense of hopelessness. I can't see where this could possibly be going, so I'm just going to be done. We can quit because of a lack of desire, because of apathy, because of laziness. It can be all sorts of things. Just the case. A few stories. Um, my son, Tobiah, he loves Legos, and so one day we're at Costco, and we saw the Vex robots, and we thought, Tobiah loves Legos, he's going to really love these things. We bring it home, and we give it to him, and he opens the box, and he's just super excited, and he's just, whoa. He starts building, and somewhere into this process of building, Nick and I realized, um, we hadn't, my, my son, Tobiah is six and a half years old, right? We had noticed that on the box it said, for ages 14 and up. <laughs> now, this thing is amazing. I mean, watch this. What? It's a catapult. Am I on this or am I on that? Is it on this or <laughs> Now, Tobiah is maybe halfway through building this thing, and I'm in the kitchen just on the other half of the room, and suddenly I hear him just scream. <laughs> And he chucks the box, and he just storms out of the room, right? Tobiah got super frustrated, and he decided he was going to switch. Now, obviously, he came back and he chucked Tobiah. But sometimes, we get frustrated, we get overwhelmed, we throw on the top. Um, the other story that comes to mind, 1993, one of the greatest American sports films of all time was released. Story of this young boy named Daniel Ruger, who went by Rudy for short, and Daniel, 
dreamed of playing the Notre Dame football team. That was his dream. That was his vision. That's what he wanted in his life. And so he worked, and he, he suffered. And now here's Rudy's problem. In order to be a football player, you've got to be about this big, right? Rudy was about this big. Well, he walked on, and he tried out, and he made the team. But the coach says to him and some of the other players, you guys are now on the Notre Dame football team, but you'll never see a game. You're on what we call the opposition team. And here's what you're going to do is you're going to learn the opponent's plays, and every week you're going to walk onto the field, and our best players are going to pound you into the ground over and over and over again. And there's this clip in the movie. It's Rudy's first practice. And basically, it's 90 seconds, a minute and a half, which in the movie is a long time, of Rudy getting smashed to the ground, and then smashed to the ground again. And then two guys come and smash him to the ground. And then the closing scene, Rudy is he's on the line. Close up. Then the scene cuts over Rudy's head to this guy who's running that way and just smashes Rudy and they both fly through the air and the guy lands on top of him. The other guy gets up and Rudy just lays there. You can kind of see him. Like, oh. Now, Hollywood producers understand the power, the emotional connection of quitting. Because they know that all of us watching this movie, we're sitting here going, Rudy, dude, walk away now, and I get it. I get it, Rudy. Like, if I was there, I would have quit 15 hits ago. Like, I, I wouldn't have made it to practice. This idea of quitting, of being hit so many times that you just can't keep going, it, it's a powerful, emotional, this raw connection. Now, Hollywood also knows the power of that tension because they know. It's what they want to say. They know that at the end of the movie, when Rudy not only gets to suit up for a game, but he gets to go and actually play on the field. And not only does he play, but he scores a touchdown for Notre Dame. We're all like, oh, you quit, Rudy! I love you! And the producers know that now I've been inspired as well. Not to quit. There's this powerful, emotional, this raw response that happens when we see the temptation to give up from others around us and when we experience that in our own lives. And I want to talk about that today because we're reading the book of First Peter. And it's actually not a book, it's a letter that a man named Peter wrote to a group of churches in the mid to late first century. Now let me tell you about Peter. Peter knows what it means to quit. Peter knows intimately what it means to quit. And if we were going to, I don't know what you guys wrote down on your papers there, but some of us might have written down, you know, like, I quit karate, it's not that big of a deal. Others of us, maybe we wrote down something pretty life altering. No matter how big of a quitting you experienced in your life, Peter has quit even bigger. We get it a couple times in the Gospels. Mark chapter 14, or Matthew 26, it's the same story. Jesus has just been arrested. And the story goes, it says all the disciples scattered and sort of fled, ran away, freaked out. And Peter's walking around at night. A little girl, or it says a girl, you know, a little, saw him and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You knew Jesus, didn't you? Now Peter, Peter and Jesus are tight. You read the gospel stories, Peter's on the inside. He's like Jesus' right-hand man, at least top three. Peter has been with Jesus every step of the way. These guys are tight. So the little girl goes, oh, wait, you're with Jesus, right? It's quiet. Peter responds, no, no, no. No, I don't know. Just a little while later, the girl sees him again and goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're one of the disciples. You know Jesus. Peter says, you're crazy. I don't know that man. Notice he doesn't even say Jesus' name. 
And then the third time, somebody else comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, I recognize your accent, Peter. You're from Galilee. You're one of the twelve. You and Jesus. You guys were tight. Scripture says, Peter called down curses upon himself and swore on oath, I do not know that man. Peter knows where he could just be in the street. He turned from his back on Jesus and walk the other direction. And here's what I think. I think that when Peter is writing his letter, the letter of 1 Peter, to all these churches in the Roman Empire, I think that he remembers what it is to turn his back on Jesus. And this letter is his plea, is his encouragement, is his instruction to say, Church, don't do the same thing that I did. Church, I know what it is to turn my back on Jesus, and I'm writing to you so that you won't turn your back on him. Peter knows what it is to quit. He's writing a letter to people who are staring that in their face. If you were here last week, you heard Steve talk about, if not, check out the sermon. It was really good. But Steve was talking about the Roman emperor, at the time this was written, was probably a guy named Nero. But even if it wasn't Nero, a lot of the same stuff is true. Nero was rotten to the core. I mean, the stuff that Nero did, having people murdered left and right, spending unbelievable amounts of money on horrible things and then taxing the people even more in a way that caused poverty and oppression to just grow and particularly in the church murdering Christians at times rounding them up tearing them from their homes sending them to another part of the empire and saying hey you're going to start a colony for me because you're excited to do this I mean, Nero was awesome so Peter knows church in the first century was suffering, was struggling, was like Rudy getting hit and hit and hit and hit. Peter's writing to his church, don't give up. Don't And I want us to get ourselves into that experience to remember what it is to be in that moment of like, I don't know if I can get up one more time. I don't know if I can go one step further. I think that's the experience of many of the people Peter is writing to. That's the experience that Peter himself knows. And that's the experience out of which he writes today's words. So, turn with me in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. These few verses are the very end of the main body of Peter's letter. So in a sense, this is Peter's summary of his whole message. He's been talking about suffering. He's been talking about serving a government. He's been talking about having healthy relationships as Christians. And now we come to his closing remarks. There's more stuff after this, but people who study this stuff generally agree. The stuff after this is kind of the, it's not the body of the letter anymore, it's kind of the wrap-up. It's kind of the, we're kind of finishing things up now. So this is very end of Peter's main message. Read with me either in your Bibles or on the screen. Peter says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over the multitude Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. There we go. <laughs> Dramatic. <laughs> Which one? Uh, this one? Okay. Good. Um, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. 
So Peter really comes in on three things that I think are his words of stay the course, stay faithful, do not turn your backs. No matter how hard your life is, here's my three words, Peter says, on how to stay the course. The first thing he says, the end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. What did he mean? What did Peter have in mind? We come up with a lot of different possibilities of what Peter means when he says the end of all things is near. Here's our best guess. Peter's writing from a Christian perspective. And the Christian perspective is by and large the same as for thousands of years the Jewish perspective before that. So here's Jewish big history in a nutshell. Long, 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 long ago. Right here, not the outside. God created everything. God created it, created it all good. All of it. Everything. God looked at everything that he made and he said, it's all good. Now, we fast forward over a bunch of stuff to today. And we look around and we say something has changed between it's all good and now. Something has clearly changed. We don't have to look very far. The Iraqi military is uh, laying siege on Mosul, trying to root out um, an ISIS cell there. There was another earthquake in Italy. There are so many examples around the world and in our own community of this is just not the way it's supposed to be. But the promise throughout history, generation after generation after generation, the promise that God has always made is, it's not going to stay this way. It's not going to stay this way. Because I'm going to send my Messiah, and I will make everything right again. The way Christians, the way the Jews before them have understood history is kind of in three epics. The beginning when all was good, the present time when all is fallen and broken, and the future time when the Messiah will make everything right. When Peter says the end is near, what he means is the Messiah has come. And even though we don't know exactly how this story is going to end, we know that the power to heal every hurt, the power to fix all that is broken, that power is here. The end is near. One way you could think about that is our perspective of the future impacts our engagement with the present. I'll give you two stories. In sixth grade, I mentioned I decided to quit playing hockey. Now, I went to hockey tryouts. Full disclosure, when I was in sixth grade, I was a runt. I was tiny. I was the smallest kid in my class. It wouldn't be until 10th grade that I gained all of my height. In one year, horribly painful growing pains in my legs. But in sixth grade, I was tiny. And I faced off against Andrew Downing in practice. And Andrew Downing hit the puck between my legs and in three seconds scored a goal from the face off. Now, at that point, a few things going on. One, I felt no great passion in calling to be a hockey player. Two, it became abundantly clear what my future in hockey was going to be. I wasn't going anywhere. So I quit. I was done. Because my perspective of the future, this isn't going anywhere, I don't even like it that much, it directly impacted how I lived in the moment. Example two, in sixth grade also, I had a teacher named Mrs. Hall. I love Mrs. Hall. God bless you, teachers. Mrs. Hall deeply believed that reading and writing and literature could change people and change communities and, and change the world. She was just passionate. So every student on their birthday, every year, she would give them a pencil. Because she wanted them to write and to read, and she believed in that. Well, just last September, it's my birthday. It's been a few years since I was in Mrs. Hall's sixth grade class, and I get a Facebook message. Dear Carl, happy birthday. Here's your digital pencil. <laughs> With a little emoji of a pencil. Mrs. Hall's 
perspective is that we can make a difference if we're all just going to do something because she believes, because she sees that perspective that the future can be different and better. She gives people a pencil every year. She never quits because of that perspective. Another way we can say this is sometimes we quit because we can't imagine a good end. One of the endings that we're imagining in our lives today, Lord, show us your endings. Give us that hope. Peter goes on. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. Okay. Therefore, so what he's saying is, I just told you our perspective of the future impacts our engagement with the present. Those are my words, not his. Therefore, as a direct result of my perspective, this should be what happens. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you might pray. Here's what I take from that. In our lives, whatever the situation in front of us, whatever the context, whatever the experience, if we respond with hysteria, or the opposite of hysteria, which I'll call apathy, then what we're often going to do is quit. Case in point, Tobias' perspective of the future was there's no way that this 14-year-old complex thing is never going to get done by me, which he changed his perspective. But his response was hysteria. He freaked out. He screamed. He threw the thing across the room. And when he did that, it was guaranteed he was never going to finish. But, Peter's exhortation, um, the text says, sober mind and self-control, or sober and, and uh, Thank you. Alert and of sober mind. Another translation that I really like said self-control and clear-mindedness. Whereas hysteria will cause us to throw in the towel, self-control and clear-mindedness, according to the scriptures, should cause us to pray. The story that came to mind when I was thinking about that, um, I used to play a lot of pool, and I had another teacher in high school named Mr. Tanya. Mr. Tanya used to say, if I meditate well enough in the mornings, I can beat anyone in pool. Well, he must not have meditated very well the day he played me. <laughs> <laughs> but, I was thinking about professional pool players, right? You ever watch a game of billiards on TV? Right, so it's like, you know, they're playing nine ball and the opponent just ran the table one to eight and there's only one ball left on the table and then the camera switches to the other guy. And what's he doing? Because in the game of pool, we become intimately aware of how hysteria will never get us where we need to go. If we want to win the game of pool, we got to be clear-minded. We have to have self-control. And Peter says the same thing. And specifically, in the Christian life, when we can keep our wits about us, when we can calm down, the natural response is then to pray. Another way you can say that is... Whatever the, whatever the struggle, whatever the problem, whatever the challenge in our life, when God is clearly the solution, then prayer is clearly our behavior. When God is clearly our solution to whatever that big problem is in our life, then prayer becomes the clear behavior we adapt. Last thing Peter says. Above all, I looked up the Greek word for all. It means all. <laughs> Everything. It's the biggest possible word you could get. Above everything. Love one another deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Okay. I don't know if you're like me, but I read that and I go, love covers over a multitude of sins. What exactly are we talking about? Now, here's what I, comes to mind. Sin, sometimes in the Bible, is called, it's referred to as a burden or a weight. So I brought in a rock. This is, this is my sin. It's kind of heavy. I could have brought in a bigger rock, but I'm not going to fool myself. 
So if love covers over a multitude of sins, does that mean I'm carrying around my big heavy burden? Yeah, there we go. Big heavy burden, and if I get love, then no, just cover it up. It's still there, still heavy, but I can't see it now. And maybe if I pretend like it's not there, it'll just go away. For anybody like me who's tried that, you know it doesn't work. Is that what Peter's talking about? Love covers over a multitude of sins? It just, we just sweep it under the rug? We just ignore it? We just close our eyes and hope that it goes away? Um, most, most likely, Peter is trying to directly reference a passage from the Proverbs that we read earlier. Proverbs 10.12 says, Hate stirs up discord or division. But love covers over all wrongs. Hate stirs up discord or division, but love covers over all wrongs. So we've got hate contrasted with love. And we've got division contrasted with covers up. So the clear implication to me is, when Peter says love covers up, I take that to mean whatever love breaks, or sorry, whatever hate breaks, love can fix. Whatever hate does, love undoes. Whatever sin has broken and wounded in our lives, love can heal. Sometimes, quit because we don't believe that love can actually heal what hate or sin or fear or suffering has broken. Lord, help us to believe that love can heal whatever sin is broken. Peter goes on then to explore how do we live out this love in our lives? How do we express this by offering hospitality to one another, by using whatever gift you have. It does not matter what your gift is. Whatever gift you have, how do we use that to serve? How do we use our speech in a way that demonstrates love above all? In a world where divisive and hurtful and critical speech is the norm, how do we use our speech to place love above all? All. Are we willing, are we willing to place love above all? To kind of put a, a closing picture on this, I was looking at another word. Um, it says, love one another deeply. And I thought to myself, deeply. I mean, that sounds nice, deeply. Well, I love you deeply. I can say that. I can say that too. Nick and I love you deeply. But it's kind of bad. It's kind of, I don't know what that means. So I looked up the word. Turns out, deeply, mm, doesn't quite do it. Um, there's this story about Jesus when he's praying by himself in a garden. And it's describing how passionately, how earnestly, how it, just engaged he is in prayer. And the word they use to describe Jesus' prayer is the same one here. So some people would call it earnestly. Other commentators or translators, they said, it shows a passionate commitment. The word that came to my mind, I like the word, like we sang earlier, relentless. How do we love in a way that says, I will never relent. I'll never turn my back. I'll never quit. I'll never give up on love. Again, we come to that same story in the garden in Mark 14. And our man Peter, it's another moment where Peter knows what it is to relent because Peter's in the garden with Jesus. And they've been praying all night. And as the story goes, one of the other disciples, Judas, brings the soldiers and they're going to arrest Jesus. Now, Peter has been with Jesus the whole time. Peter has heard Jesus say, Blessed are the peacemakers. Peter has heard Jesus say, I do not come to bring the sword. So, the soldiers come, and they arrest Jesus, and what does Peter do? 
first thing he does, I got this, Jesus! I'm going to put my sword above all right now. Peter says it, or Jesus says, no, no, no. And so along with Peter, we have to ask ourselves, there's a lot of things that can rise to the surface of our lives. There's a lot of things that can take first place in our lives. There's a lot of things that can feel, and if we let them, they can become above everything else. Our fears, our suffering, our finances, our politics, our doubts, and uncertainties. Peter invites us to follow the example of our Savior Jesus to put a relentless, a I will never turn my back, a I will never quit kind of love above everything else in our lives. As the worship team comes back up, would you guys pray with me? Lord, again, I don't know what everyone in this room is feeling. I don't know what stories are on our minds. But Lord, I imagine that maybe some of us are standing on that edge thinking, you know what, maybe it is time to give up. Maybe it is time to throw in the towel. Maybe it's something small or maybe it's something unimaginably big. But Father, I pray. Father, I pray. That as your word says, you would give us the strength right now, in this moment, Holy Spirit, you say you're with us. I pray that you would give us the strength of your relentless love. Lord, if we feel like we've been hit too many times and we just can't get back up, I pray that you give us the strength of your relentless love. Lord, if we're in community with others and we know that people need a hand and an arm and a shoulder to cry, and I pray that we would lift one another up with your relentless love. Lord, I pray that wherever we might have a hopelessness, that we just can't see how you could possibly bring something good. Lord, give us that perspective that your relentless love will set all things right. Oh, we pray that you help us, Lord. We pray that you help us. We pray that you give us an opportunity today to live out your relentless love.